So we're here at the Open Source Bridge 2011 conference here in Portland. And uh, both of us brought uh, hardware, open source hardware, and showed it off at the conference one way or another. Actually, I didn't. I virtualized my hardware and oh, just gave a talk about hardware, but never actually brought any oh, hardware. Oh, well, OK. So <laughs> mine's a little smaller, so it was easy to bring. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and we're here to talk a little bit about you know, why we care about that and think open is good for hardware. And, uh, you know, I think uh, both of us are involved in DorkBot, and I thought maybe you'd say a few words about how you got started in uh, DorkBot. Okay, well, this is actually Ward Cunningham, and uh, he's kind of like one of the older people in our group in terms of <laughs> actually being, uh, having been a, a, a dork, if you will, uh, for much longer than most of us. Um, and I'm Don Davis, and, um, and, um, I was actually involved in the inception of DorkBot uh, through the Portland Area Robotics Society. Um, and I had actually, um, we had Thomas Lockney, who's, mm -hmm. who came up mm -hmm. from Texas, where there was an active DorkBot community, uh, wanted to start one in Portland. And he came to the, the Portland Area Robotics Society meeting and um, said, I want to start this. So we got on a mailing list. and. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there was a bunch of us had conversations, and we just kept saying, okay, so when are we going to do this? I said, we should have a meeting. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the Portland's good for that sort of activity, but, but DorkBot actually started in, uh, in at Columbia, right? At in, Dork, in the music school there. Uh, DorkBot actually grew out of an art show, uh, an exhibition in New York called ArtPod. Mm -hmm. It was every year, and I actually submitted several pieces that were rejected mm -hmm. when I was looking at building these robots that drew. Mm -hmm. um, I was working on this drawing machine project. Yeah. And uh, from the ArtBot um, expedition came these groups of people. Right. And uh, there were, at the time that we started ours, I think there were 120. Cities with? Cities yeah. with actual All active, over the globe. Uh, yeah. All over the country and all over the globe, yeah. Um, the moniker of DorkBot is people doing strange things with electricity. Um, our group is doing a lot of interesting and technical things with electricity. Uh, I'm kind of, at, at this point, I'm in a transitional period where I'm kind of kind of backing away from the DorkBot group and trying to do more outreach to artists. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Because our group has gotten to be very technically focused. Yes. Which is unlike a lot of the, the DorkBots. Yeah, I, I, I first encountered the group up in Seattle and mm -hmm. uh, much more of an art focus, mm -hmm. but you know, kind of Burning Man style art, lots of technology in the art. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you, you know, I'm a technologist more than an artist, although what I, what I think of DorkBot you know, I'll call it art, just meaning that I'm not trying to satisfy some manufacturability. You know, if I make one and it delights me, right. you know, I'm done. Right. I don't have to to make something that's better than that. But actually, that turns out to be better than most things that are manufactured. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that our group has done, and some of this is uh, open source related, and other parts of it are just community and democracy related. Um, our group has done a very good job of, of doing some very innovative things, such as for the first two years we did a group order mm -hmm. where uh, people were working on projects. We took common parts and pooled them every other week into a group order. So um, a processor, if you buy one, costs $5. If you buy 25 of them, costs three. Yeah. So by pooling, we were able to actually go through and get most of our parts costs down. And then also it pushed us to work on our projects because we had actually parts coming. Right. And, uh, and then also in the initial days, it was like a lot about sharing. Which right. Because people were bringing things. That's right. So, you, you, uh, so everybody gets a bunch of the parts, and they're all working on the same parts. And so they learn about the parts together and figure out what to do with it. And you know, I think you know, somebody's doing something, and I think that's cool. Well, I want to do that too. Let me see if I can do it. And you know, do it a little better, do it a little differently, or, or something like that. I have to say that I found DorkBot uh, here in Portland to be a very supportive group mm -hmm. in the sense that, uh, uh, you know, whatever you got going, you can just bring it and show it, and people come around and they're interested in it. And, right. uh, you know, the, you know, it's kind of like a little mini science fair and, and with beer, and, <laughs> and that helps. And so, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a good way to uh, kind of keep going. Mm -hmm. on something that you want to do, but it's hard to find time to do, but right. you want to do it, and, it, and it, gives you, 
on a, on a, a dork bot here meets every other Monday. Mm -hmm. uh, so every other Sunday, I'm thinking, gosh, I haven't worked on my dork bot project, so I'll make up something that I can right. do in a day and bring it right. bring it down. I haven't gotten to that point lately. Um, well, one of the things I've been teaching these classes, the induction yes. classes, and then focus workshops on top of that. Um, and I've had almost 300 students through these things yes. in the Portland area. And I think maybe 10 of them would actually build robots that uh -huh. made art, which was kind of my goal. My goal was I started, we did, one of the things that, one of the earlier things that we did was we coattailed on a on a Portland Area Robotics Annual yes. Exhibition yeah. and we did an art bot competition. Mm -hmm. We only had two or three people do that. Although Steve Davey, one of our members, brought his stuff for the kids mm -hmm. and everybody's kids built some really crazy stuff. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. Um, so I started thinking, well, okay, so how do I get more people involved in, in the, the ability to compete in an art bot competition? Right, make, right. Make a robot that makes art. Yes. And so I started teaching these classes, and I've been doing them for almost, well, actually four years. Be, yeah, yeah. This year would be the fourth year, fourth year I've been doing these classes. And, and this is all, uh, I think the foundation of all this is if you need some technology, uh, it's available out there and it's open source. It's not like you have to go to the man and pay hundreds of dollars to get stuff. You know, that, right. that there's a real theme of uh, keep it cheap, keep it free, keep it simple, uh, but powerful. Right. And um, one of the things that the physical computing environment brings to that is a, is a kind of a standardized platform mm -hmm. with lots of code samples and lots of people working on that platform. Um, and actually pushing it kind of to its limits. Mm -hmm. It's really kind of interesting to see the Arduino evolve from when we started this whole thing, and you could still make an Arduino uh, with a through-hole kit and build it all yourself, mm -hmm. and actually you could etch the board. Yeah, They yeah. had a one-layer design where you could actually go through and have parties where people have parties and etch the may, board. May make the boards themselves. Make the boards yeah. themselves. And, um, well, I bet that stunk. <laughs> Well, well, just just in chemicals, <laughs> you know. I, mean. I don't know. I've been I've been doing I've I've been pretty successful with uh, with um, muriatic mm -hmm. and uh, hydrogen peroxide. Yeah, get them at the hardware store, and um, but yeah, the the ferro chloride. Yeah, that stinks and makes a hell of a mess. Yeah, when you <laughs> spill it on something, the ammonium persulfate stank pretty badly and was really temperamental. Um, and then, you know, um, actually the, even the tinning kind of smells bad. But that, that was kind of what you had to do back then because you couldn't uh, find a hundred stores online that were selling uh, the, the, the same devices and so forth. And well, it's, it's, you know, at least in terms of Arduino, mm -hmm. there's a lot going there. But then people realize, gosh, you know, there's nothing special about the Arduino project. There's lots of ways to run projects. And I think that that idea that you might do a hardware design mm -hmm. and share the design files and so forth mm -hmm. and try to get a community around some other kind of platform, whether it's for balloons or, uh, you know, ham radio or something. There's just, there's just a lot of kind of standardization of hardware that really drives the cost down. Well, I think also one of the other things that this group has done that's extremely innovative is to take something like SparkFun. SparkFun is kind of like the star, Starbucks of, of like, is an indicator species. Yeah, yeah. So if you wanted to go through and try out a new chip or a new process, um, you could find it at SparkFun for enough markup that you could actually develop a product around it yeah, and yeah. have enough margins to actually successfully build a company. Right. Because right. their margins are like that. And batch PCB is one of the things where people don't want to go through and do all this etching at home. Mm -hmm. um, and so they had a service where, well, we're shipping stuff off to China. so. Why don't we go through and take your boards and put them in our shipment to China? Mm -hmm. And um, but what we've done is we looked at that and we said, well, that's okay. But what we really want is we want to know when our boards are coming back. Right. We just send them whenever they want, whatever. Yeah, they yeah, send whenever them they feel special. like. Yeah. And also, uh, one of the things that we've been working really hard on as a group, and it's kind of an interesting thing that the ethic, the group shares as an ethic, is localized production. Yes. So. So what one of our members has done is actually put together a batch PCB system, which is where each time you build a board, the cost is um, the cost is actually in the in individual board, and most of the, f the fab houses will charge you per square inch. Mm -hmm. And it gets quite expensive depending on how many you're going to make. Right. But if you pull things together into like a panel. One, one big board with one a lot of people's stuff on with it. With a lot of people's stuff on it, then you actually pay a much smaller cost. 
And so we've actually done that where we panelize and we group order, we do a group order, and we keep the fabrication in America. Mm -hmm. And that has been really very popular. In fact, people from all over the world are actually buying these boards. So when you go onto the Dorkbot channel, it's like half the, half the people are on the board because they're actually building around this group batch PCB that, uh -huh, that one uh -huh, of our members uh -huh. has created. Yeah, yeah. So, so how do people find out about this? Well, if they're interested, if that sounds interesting, and they say, gee, I'd kind of like to learn how to do this, and, and there's sort of a, you know, you mentioned the classes mm -hmm. you've taught, but, you know, just, you know, and I said that Dorkbot is welcoming, yeah. but, you know. W well, most, most of the focus is, at, uh, and most of the, the things that we do are linked off of the, um, in fact, my, the boards that I teach my classes with, there's actually sections on the Dorkbot PDX site. Mm -hmm. And you can find the Dorkbot PDX site by going to dorkbotpdx.org, or you can actually go to Dorkbot, Look at all the sites around the world and pick and Portland. Pick Portland. Yeah. Um, so all those sites in the world, Portland. Right. And there's also a mailing list. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a mailing list and an announced list. We have one that's called the Blabber, mm -hmm. um, which is a really nice notation. Uh, I annotation. was suspicious, but I subscribed to Blabber, and I'm glad I did. Well, I think the the thing that's interesting about Blabber is that there's a lot of things that people are talking about that aren't necessarily doing weird things with electricity. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're working on a problem. Sometimes they're working on something mm -hmm. else. Sometimes they're like, oh, hey, did anybody see this really cool thing? Right. And uh, because it's blabber, you can just go through and blab. It's you know, right. and the same thing with the IRC channel. Uh, internet, we have an internet re relay chat channel, and that's actually linked on the Dorkbot site as well. Yeah. Um, and there's lots of people, like I said, who come into the channel. Um, in fact, we have three or four people that come into the channel from, from other channels. Like there's a channel where like one of us would go off to the AVR channel and start mm -hmm. looking at a problem with the processors that are the right. most popular in our group. And then like after a while, they'd start hanging out in our channel and just talk to us directly in right, our right, channel. Right, so it's right. kind of like, so we have this, this sub-community of people from all over the world who kind of hang out in Portland mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. working on these problems. So uh, what do you think... Uh, you know, kind of looking forward, if we want to encourage, uh, you know, the, the, the open source bridge sort of community, mm -hmm. the, the, the people who care about the, you know, philosophy and ethics of openness, which is mm -hmm. really what this conference is about. It's more right. not about any particular thing, but just people who care about that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I know you do. What, what, uh, what's turning you on? You know, what, what do you think is going to happen in the next year between now and then? What's going to be the big thing? A year from now at Open Source Bridge, in uh, in terms of uh, hardware or strange things with electricity, or or, e or even uh, art built on uh, openness. Well, one of the things that I'd like to do is actually just see Dorkbot grow into three or four groups, and mm -hmm. that's something I've talked about quite a bit. So, I'd like to do an art art outreach product project called Artbot PDX, mm -hmm. and actually um, spin off the discussion parts and maybe the website part into. The art section is that because Dorkbot PDX has gotten a little intimidating with the the, the electronics? Or no, because I'm passionate about oh, the art. Yeah. I'm okay, not, I, I I I wholeheartedly support Dorkbot's push into these areas mm -hmm. and have promoted. One of the things about Dorkbot is that it is democratic. It's yeah. an active democratic organization. We're not talking democracy. We're promoting democracy. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And, and in fact, the leadership for you know, the traditional leadership in Dorkbot from when it started in, in Dorkbot PDX, when yeah. it started, actually has kind of backed away. And there's an entirely new group of people that are actually running it, like Jim Eastman. Uh -huh. uh, he's one of the open source people here, and he's actually running the classes. I no longer actually manage the liaison mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. PNCA, where we give our right. monthly classes. He does that. Um, Jesse and... Alex Norman, um, Alex really heavy into the GPL. Yeah, um, those guys are actually taking an active hands-on, and they're actually kind of like the new junta. Uh huh. Um, uh -huh. The rule, the you know, <laughs> our to, to the sense there is any, you know. Yeah. I, and what, yeah. what I like about Dorkbot is, uh, you know, you're you're a member if you think you're a member. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, you don't get a card, you don't right. pay dues. You right. know, that uh, that's my kind of organization. The other thing that I think will happen this next year is that we'll have enough people working on the ARM processor mm -hmm. to where I think you'll see the open source tool chain for the ARM processor actually enter the mainstream in that group. Yeah. And for that reason, I don't actually want to go, th I, I will definitely keep my foot in the, uh, in the, in the community because yeah. I think that what, some of the things that, uh, that Scott Dixon and Jim Larson and um, even I think Paul Stoffergan once mm -hmm. it gets there, 
um, will will actually come out with is a pretty heavy platform for for the the lower cost arms, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which will mean that we'll be able to actually do more exciting projects for much less money. Yeah, I, I think that uh, the the Arduino is a pretty amazing thing if you want to actually just wiggle bits around, but. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you start computing with it, you know it uh, it slows down, and 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 it's it's crazy to, uh, you know, in the in the in the modern world with the cost of the parts, you know, is is so darn low to uh, to be building without having a great part. And I, I think, I, but I think it still has a lot of, of purpose. Um, mm -hmm. One of the one of the things that I've come out of this particular conference with is kind of reinvigorating a conversation that I've had with some people that are working in K twelve. Uh -huh. And trying to actually go through and use get away from the closed source Lego League uh, yeah, robotics yeah, yeah. into an open source doable. I mean, I, I promoted, I actually uh, volunteered for and coached first Lego League when my kid yeah, and went yeah. to state the first five times. And what happens is that is that the schools are spending a remarkable amount of money on a very small group of people, whereas mm. for the same amount of money, you could actually go through and teach. You know, for the same amount of money they spend on two kids, they could go through and teach two classrooms and have everyone walk away with their equipment. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. And uh, so, so uh, some of the people at this conference and I have been talking about actually making, making the curriculum part of that. Now, I don't want to teach it, but I definitely want to support the technical side of that, right, and I think that the Arduino right. plays a big part of that. Well, you know, I uh, a lot of times people talk about, gee, where do the hackers come from these days? You know, everybody's too into their video games mm -hmm. or whatever. And I say, well, if you're worried about that, just buy a few Arduinos. And uh, when the kid next door asks you something technical, show them an Arduino and let them have it. You know, yeah. you give those machines away, and and uh, you know, it's it's not that expensive. But that, you know, and kind of the kickstart, kind of learning how to download the software that's all free, and uh, and uh, start creating. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. I so, uh, and and I think this is uh, this has been a great event for that. I I felt well received and. I did, as well. I, yeah. I did as well. I did as well. I was, um, I was kind of skeptical. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. And and part of it is Portland. I want to brag about Portland, but uh, you know I think part of it is. Uh, uh, well, you know you, you you contribute and, and amazing things come back to you. Mm -hmm. That's my experience. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. I can see that. Um, it's kind of interesting, the, the Portland aspect of this. Yeah. It's like, oh, let's go to a conference and hang out with people that I would normally hang out at. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because the, the, this conference is actually made up of people that are actually doing a lot of, there's a lot of crossover. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's a good thing. So do we have anything else that we wanted to I, talk I about? I think we're kind of wound up here. Yeah? Are we good? Yeah. Okay. Did we do a good job there? <laughs> <laughs>